But and she made a little duck. Morning. Very nice. All right. Um, thank you guys for joining us for breakfast this morning. This is the last day in Open Access Week. This is the first library CTE partnered event of the year. I suppose hopefully one of many come. Um, but I'm Jamie Hazlett. I'm the librarian for collection development and evaluation. And on behalf of um, Dean Christine Brancolini, um, I'd like to welcome you to this morning's event with Nicole Allen, who's the director of Open Education at Spark, which stands for the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. Um, first off, I need to give a shout out and a thank you to our co-sponsor for the event. Like I said, the Center for Teaching Excellence. Um, we're really grateful to Martina for her support and for helping us to make this event happen. Um, I also want to thank Kat Weaver, um, Jose Badenas, and Marnie Campbell for your encouragement and support. Um, we had a really fantastic dinner with Nicole last night and had a chance to kind of talk a little bit about what open educational resources might and could look like at LMU, what some of the opportunities are, what some of the obstacles, and we look forward to continuing that conversation after today's talk. Um, so for the past two years um, at the William H. Hannon Library, we have done what we can um, to help make course materials affordable for our students. Um, so in collaboration with the University Bookstore and with some of our fabulous faculty, we created the Course Adopted Text eBook Initiative, which is um, colloquially called CATS, um, where what we do is we cross-reference the faculty course adopted text list from the bookstore with our holdings in the library and or what we can purchase from publishers in multi-user eBook format. Um, so when we find a match, we've been notifying faculty um, so they have the option to share the link with the ebook with their students and provide that as one less textbook that they may need to buy. Um, so in fall 2017, nearly 14% of the titles adopted for course use were available as unlimited user ebooks in the library. Um, I notified 110 faculty across 28 academic departments, and we hope that these numbers can continue to grow. But we're limited to what we can get from the publishers, and so this CATS program is only just one way that we can work with our faculty to make educational materials more accessible for our students. Um, the possibilities available to us via open access and open educational resources are promising, and they encourage us to think differently about pedagogy, about scholarly communication, and about access to information resources. So our speaker today will help us to think through some of these possibilities. Nicole Allen is director of Open Education for Spark, which is an international alliance of academic and research libraries working to make open the default in both research and education. Nicole is an internationally recognized advocate and thought leader in the open education movement who has worked tirelessly to expand access and affordability of education in the digital age since her own days as a college student. Over the last decade, Nicole has given hundreds of talks and trainings in more than a dozen countries on open education, education policy, and grassroots organizing. <coughs> Based in Washington, D.C., Nicole's portfolio at Spark includes a robust state and federal policy program, a broad librarian community of practice, and a leadership program for OER librarians. So please join me in welcoming Nicole Allen. I'm excited to see such a great mix of people um, in the room, and I look forward to spending the next 40 minutes or so chatting about open education and equity. So just to start out, a um, uh, quick heads up about my talk. Um, I have a lot of slides, but I move really quickly. So uh, if there's anything that you want to follow up on, um, you can download uh, these slides from my slide share, and I also tweeted it from my Twitter account um, if you're on Twitter and you can get access to them there. And I should note that this is all also openly licensed, so it's an open educational resource in itself. <laughs> um, so uh, just a little bit of quick background on Spark, the organization I work for. Uh, so as Jamie said, International Alliance of Academic and Research Libraries, and our mission is all about changing the way that we share knowledge in today's world to really fully leverage the connected abilities that we have, the technologies that we have, uh, to make sure that the, the goals and missions that, that we have as educators and institutions are aligned with the outcomes that we want to see, which is a stronger society, 
uh, better equipped students, uh, and making sure that uh, the wealth of human knowledge is accessible all over the world. So we celebrate International Open Access Week every year to make sure that we're raising awareness of the idea of openness as an enabling strategy to help achieve those outcomes of expanding access to knowledge. And this year's theme is especially important. It's about equity and designing equitable foundations for, for open knowledge. And we're at this point where the idea of openness, and we'll get into a little bit more about what that means for education later on, but the idea of openness is really starting to catch on uh, here in the US and all across the world as a model for sharing information. But as it's starting to catch on and we have the beginnings of uh, structures building at institutions to enable more open practices, we have to ask a lot of questions about how open is it and for whom is it open and make sure that as we make things more open, we're not inadvertently constructing barriers that we're not aware of and making sure that as we transition to a new system that is more open, that it has equity at its core. So in, in the interest of uh, equity and inclusivity, <laughs> I want to pause here and I'd really like to know more about who's in the room uh, before I start talking at you. Uh, and um, so I think we have another mic and it would be great if we could just go around. Um, I'd love to hear what, what your name is, uh, what you do at the university, um, if you're a professor, what department. Uh, and feel free to share um, a quick note about anything that you're really hoping to hear about today. Maybe it's a question you have. Maybe it's, it's something that you feel strongly about. Um, feel free to share that. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jennifer Masnaga. I'm a reference librarian here at the library. Um, I work at the School of Education. And I really just um, want to have an overview of everything. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Hi, I'm Elisa Costa from the library, and I'm just interested in learning. Um, we did do an open access information privilege workshop for the summer undergraduate research program this summer. Hi, I'm Darlene Aguilar. I'm the instructional design librarian, and I'm new to higher education, so all of this is it's great to learn about. Hi, I'm Rachel Wett Blutzia, and I am a Special Collections Instruction Librarian. Um, I feel open access is such an important, important topic and so exciting. And so I would be curious to learn about both the benefits but also some of the challenges that um, we may face as we enter this field. Hi, I'm Linda Kunota Barandil. I'm an Assistance and Digital Initiatives Library Assistant. I'm new to open access, so I'm just here to learn more about it. Hi, I'm Marissa Ramirez. I'm the Archival Processing Assistant, but I'm also a library school student, and I actually wrote a paper on this topic, so I'm interested in learning more. Fantastic. <coughs> Morning, Paul Harris from English. Uh, I'm a professor, and I'm interested from the standpoint of being a journal editor, and uh, we're starting a new series in Born Digital Works of Theory, and that's open access right now, and we're thinking about how to move forward with that. We're also starting to publish some open access articles in our journal. I'm also working with uh, Melanie Hubbard, the Digital Scholarship Librarian, and uh, collaborating on teaching a digital humanities class and want to develop online content. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, Glenn johnson Grell, um, Head of Acquisitions and Collection Development in the library. And I'm just very interested in seeing kind of where the library and faculty perspectives, where where the distance between where we are right now and kind of the next steps in moving uh, us all in the same direction. Um, Jeff Gatton, Associate Dean of the Library, and I'm interested in um, learning more about how. Okay. I'm interested in learning more about um, how the library, uh, or the best ways the library can um, facilitate, or help facilitate um, open access. Hi, I'm Kat Weaver. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm from the Provost Office, and I'm interested in kind of seeing an overview of what this looks like in higher education, as well as where the points of opportunity and advocacy are. 
Uh, hi, I'm Elizabeth Drummond. I'm in the history department. Uh, and I've done a lot of work with students on public-facing assignments and public history, um, but I'm also interested in it just in terms of access for students to materials. I'm Neil Weavers. I'm in the theater, uh, Department of Theater, Arts, and Dance, and I'm a costume designer. I'm very interested in how you work with images and objects in terms of this, and what kinds of partnerships you do internationally as well as nationally. I'm Cynthia Becht. I'm head of archives and special collections here in the library and also the librarian liaison for theater arts. Um, besides being interested in seeing what's going on from a professional stance, I have to say that I'm personally really interested in this. All the kids in my family are of college or soon college age, so this is a, this is a topic that's actually um, the family's talking about. Hi, I'm Marnie Campbell. I'm um, <clears throat> an associate professor in African American Studies. I'm also the faculty senate president. Um, I'm interested in um, course affordability issues and also being able to diversify um, um, texts for, for courses. Jamie Hazlett, and I'm the lead for the library's course adopted text ebook program, and I'm really interested in learning how the library can support faculty to take the next step. Hi, I'm Farrell Sharif, and I'm from Political Science, and I'm interested in becoming better informed. Hi, I'm Martina Ramirez, Director of the Center for Teaching Excellence and Professor of Biology. So I'm co-sponsoring this event because I think this is an important conversation to have, and especially I'm interested in best practice in terms of institutional structures, policies, procedures, whatever, to facilitate and support faculty and endeavors in this area. So. Hi, I'm Ray Andrade. I work out of the library's outreach department as the librarian for student engagement. In that position, I work very closely with, with the student affairs division. And um, I know that the current president of ASLME, the student government body, he, one of his platforms is college affordability. So there's definitely, not surprisingly, a, a need for lowering the cost of higher education. Uh, hi there, I'm Jeff Schwartz. I'm an instructional technologist here at the university, uh, working primarily to support faculty in all things teaching and learning. I'm uh, interested in uh, this conversation as it's, uh, I think, an important topic that will be coming to campus and how we can best support uh, the new technologies and integrating things with our learning management system. Hi, I'm Nicole Lawson. I'm the instructional designer at the School of Education for online courses specifically. Um, I'm also an anthropologist, and so I'm really interested in questions of, you know, cultural diversity and social equity, particularly in the online context and open ed. Hi, I'm Michelle Young. I'm an uh, instructional technologist assigned to the Science and Engineering College. I think some of the professors understand open access from a research point of view, but they don't necessarily think about putting that into the classroom in terms of textbooks and resources, so I'd like to know more about everything. I'm B.J. Johnson, and I'm a professor in the Computer Science Department. I'm also the Computer Science uh, Liaison to the Library. Um, I'm primarily concerned with, it, for this meeting, uh, finding out how to save the students money on their textbooks. Uh, textbooks are extremely expensive in my discipline, so I'm primarily concerned with that. All right, that's everyone. Well, thank you to all of you for taking time out of your day to be here. And uh, I heard a lot of really interesting points. Um, so a lot of people were saying they just want to become better informed. So um, <laughs> that will definitely be part of this. Um, interest in saving students money and affordability and access to course materials. Uh, interesting, uh, in, interest in, in forging collaborations between the library and teaching and learning and faculty. And also some examples of interest in innovative forms of pedagogy or finding diversity of content and helping to build that in uh, to more open materials. So I'm excited. Um, I think I'll have a little bit of everything in this. Um, and uh, happy to take more time at the end to chat a little bit more. So I want to start out by um, just reflecting on this statement. Students can't learn from materials that they can't afford. And this is an unfortunate reality. This is the world that we live in. 
you know, I, I think we all know that higher education overall is become really expensive and students have to take on increasing amounts of debt in order to get access uh, to an education and textbooks are on top of that and it's gotten to the point where students are not able to afford or do not have access to all of the materials that they need. So conversation, the conversation about open education needs to start here and reflecting on the fact that right now students don't have access to the materials that they need. I also want to acknowledge that the uh, mission of LMU includes social justice and education is a great equalizer and it's how uh, you know, next generations can uh, better themselves beyond their parents and we consider it uh, the greatest tool of, of social mobility. And uh, you know, if everybody has access to educational opportunities and the same resources in order to get an education, uh, that's possible. And that's a state of equity, when everybody has access to the same resources and opportunities without discrimination or barriers. Uh, but the reality is that is not the society we live in. Uh, if you look at some of the, the statistics out there, uh, who your parents are matters. Persistence, whether you complete your degree, uh, is it varies by whether your parents attended college or not. First generation students face a much larger barrier than their peers who had parents who know the ropes, who've been through college, uh, you know, know not to necessarily go to the bookstore on the first day of class and buy your books there, but to price shop first. Uh, who know, um, you know, the, the perils of student loans and how to fill out the FAFSA and all of the challenges that, that students face without parents who've been through that, uh, it's harder. And it affects whether students are able to complete an education. Uh, I think you know, we all recognize that there are race disparities and ethnicity disparities in the United States. Credential attainment um, it tends to be lower for people of color um, versus their white uh, fellow Americans. And um, it's overall on the rise but still there's disparity. And the idea of the typical student is just not true anymore. I think we all tend to imagine you know, the 18 to 20 something uh, co-ed <laughs> who shows up on, on college campus, um, lives on campus, uh, completes their degree in four years. That's just not the reality we live in. 74% of students in the United States have one characteristic that is considered atypical. Um, whether that's they transfer between institutions, they work full-time or part-time, their parents, um, they're uh, at an older age, uh, they have um, uh, their first-generation students attending to your colleges. So the, the typical vision of a student just isn't true in our society. So let's dive a little bit deeper about what that means when it comes to course materials, which is a component of education. Um, so this is an example of a textbook that uh, might be assigned uh, at, a, at an institution like LMU, Mancuse Economics. Um, were there any economics faculty here? I, didn't, I don't think I heard anybody. Okay, that's good because it's sometimes awkward when this is the book. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anybody want to guess how much this book costs? Four hundred dollars. Have you seen this stock before? I can see it on your side. Oh. <laughs> well, okay, you're correct. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, but yes, four hundred and six dollars. So this is actually so. Um, this publisher has actually dropped. I should note for the record that this publisher has actually dropped the price slightly below $400 since I've started using this slide. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's connected, <laughs> uh, but um, I, I should acknowledge that. But this actually existed. This was reality, uh, you know, within months. $406 for a principles of economics textbook. I mean, think about that. Uh, that is a huge amount of money. And, uh, you know, you could understand the economic principles underpinning why it might be possible for a publisher to charge $400, but you have to pay $400 first. Um, okay, so the price of textbooks has been rising rapidly. Uh, so since I started working on this issue when I was a college student, so I, I, I was inspired to work 
on open education and college affordability. Um, I was a student at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington, so a liberal arts and private institution. And uh, I was so frustrated by the, the high cost of that education. It was a fantastic education. And I was fortunate enough to be able to afford it, but I saw people around me who were really struggling. And it was textbooks that really struck me as a huge barrier. Because it's like you can figure out how to pay for tuition and fees and all of those expenses, but then comes textbooks. And if you look at it in the context of um, the bottom one is a private nonprofit for your for your budget um, from the college board uh, tuition and fees it's uh, uh, average is, is about thirty three thousand dollars that's a large amount of money and if you look at textbooks the twelve hundred ish is the light blue stripe there so if you look at a graph like this it doesn't look like that much money but that's not how a student experiences this type of expense. So two-thirds of the students in this country are taking on loans to be able to afford their education. So that is covering most of those costs. The costs that you have to encounter after that uh, are the ones that hit you the hardest because you're often paying for that out of pocket or trying to figure out how to come up with that last, you know, uh, how, however much students are spending um, on, on textbooks themselves. And uh, I, I like to say it's, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back in a lot of cases. It's where students make decisions that do uh, undermine their ability to succeed in class because they don't have access to the materials that, that they really need. Uh, and you know, I think we all recognize that today's students are really facing uh, financial challenges. The, the amount of students uh, who are experiencing food insecurity is on the rise. And, we don't necessarily know whether it's on the rise or we're just paying attention to it more. But the number of, of schools that are establishing, for example, food pantries is growing. Uh, you have one here. Fantastic. Um, so, so uh, you know, students who are, you know, you can't study if you're hungry. You're going to perform worse on a test if, you're, if you do it while you're hungry. Uh, and, you know, universities have to provide access to food in order to help their students learn. Like, this is, these are really challenging times. Uh, so, you know, we need to think about the straws that are breaking the camel's back and where we can make progress on uh, helping to reduce those costs. And textbooks are one of those areas. Uh, it's, it's one of those areas where because of kind of a, a freak in the way that the economics of the market work, it's allowed prices to balloon exponentially in a way that doesn't match the value of the resources that students are getting access to. And we have a solution at our fingertips with open educational resources, which we'll talk in a minute. Uh, but the economics of this situation really come, comes down to the market structure, which is actually quite similar to the way that prescription drugs work, where uh, you, you, know, you have a decision about what a consumer needs to buy being made by somebody else. And just like prescription drugs, um, you know, your doctor is, is the most important person to make the decision about what you need for your health, just like a professor is the right person to make the decision about what materials you need to learn. Uh, but it does create this situation where it's a captive market. Students have to buy whatever books they've been assigned. So publishers know that they can set prices really high because they're, they're valuing the cost of the material not against what they think the material is worth, but what they think access to the materials they need for their education is worth. It's exacerbated by the fact that the traditional market is dominated by five major companies that, that hold the vast majority of the market and engage in the same kind of pricing practices. So the $400 textbook is an extreme example. But it is not unusual to see $100, $200, $300 price tags, especially in high enrollment courses that are at the beginning of a student's academic career, uh, you know, where they're at risk of potentially dropping out or not continuing. But we're also in this like interesting situation where we are facing these you know four hundred dollar price tags for print books, but we're starting to see digital options become available. And I think there, and it's been gradual over the last decade. And there's been this sense that oh, okay, this will all be solved by putting materials online because you know those can be distributed for free. You don't need to print them and ship them and um, uh, pay for all of those associated costs. 
But the challenge is that the, the traditional industry hasn't really provided an answer uh, with digital textbooks that is equitable for students. So this is what you can get for uh, the, the $400 economics textbook. You can get the digital standalone um, for $126. So that's better for sure, $126. It's a third of the price. Um, you know, given that choice, I think you know, it does give students options. But the challenge with that is that you don't know until you put it in your cart that it's only six months of access. And I know we don't have economists in the room, but anybody know how many semesters are in an economics covered by principles of economics? Two. Micro and macro are included in this book. So 126 Not times two? Hmm? Not here. Not here? OK. I do it in one semester here. Fair enough. Good to know. Uh, for many students who are using this, though, they might buy access to this and discover that they have to buy it all over again. or that they buy access but then need to drop the course halfway through or they don't make it through the course. Uh, and then they don't have the option to access it again in the future. And it's also just sending a, a, a really bad message to students. Like, you know, students today have grown up in a world where we have access to information instantly at our fingertips. And that's just an expectation. And that, that digital material is always available. Um, but this sets it up so that it isn't permanent. It's temporary. It says that these materials aren't important enough for you to need to keep. They're just temporary while you're in the course. And I like to liken it to, to the men in black model of <laughs> textbooks, which is you better, you better study up and read your textbook fast because flash, we're going to flash it away from your memory. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so all of this is to say that we've gotten to this situation where we're in a really dire position where students don't have access to the materials they, that they need. So two in three students say that they've decided against buying a textbook because the cost is too high. And this is um, total, but if you break it down by type of institution, it's pretty consistent across all types of institutions. Uh, about half of students say that at some point they've taken fewer courses due to the cost of textbooks, so they're taking longer to get through their education, uh, maybe not taking the courses that they want to take. And then this one is interesting. So the book industry study group found that less than half of the students in any given course say that they have the current edition of the textbook that they were assigned. So those of you who are a faculty member, half of the students in your classroom, maybe less, have the book you told them to buy. Uh, the rest of them have an older edition, uh, maybe an international uh, gray market copy. Um, some probably pirated it from online. Um, you know, some may be sharing with a roommate, uh, two, three, four kids who buy one textbook and, and all chip in for the cost. Uh, maybe the library has a copy on reserve that they can check out during certain times, but um, maybe not all the time. Uh, students may um, have you know, photocopied parts of the book uh, or just study from the notes of a classmate. Uh, so less than half of the students overall have the material they're supposed to have. And that's failure, that this market has failed to equip students with the materials that they're supposed to have for their education. So the conversation about what's next and how do we create a more equitable system of course materials in higher education to address these cost issues that students are now facing in terms of affording a higher education. It's not gonna solve the whole problem, but it's gonna solve a piece of it that's really significant. Uh, and it also creates exciting opportunities to not just address costs, but actually make education better by making it more open. And that's how we come to this idea of, of open educational resources. Uh, or OER. Um, so how many of you knew this term before you walked in here? Or who wants to define it? Great. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's awesome. All of you raised your hand, uh, I think. Well, most everybody raised your hand. I, I'll define it anyway. Um, so uh, when we talk about open educational resources, we're talking about educational resources. So any type of uh, material you might use in your course. It includes textbooks, but also might be things like PowerPoint slides or lecture, video lectures, your lecture notes, uh, tutorials, assessments, any, anything like that. 
Uh, and the difference is that they are open. And the word open means something very specific. Um, it means that the material is free, meaning free of cost to students, and free of barriers. So you don't have to like log in, uh, um, and uh, it's, it's available to everyone. And then uh, the second part is permission, uh, or reuse rights. And we like to describe those with the five R's. So uh, by permission, we mean that you have the right to retain the material. So keep and control a copy forever. You're not going to run into the men in black uh, moment <laughs> where it flash disappears. Uh, students can keep all of their, their course materials on a flash drive if they want to. Uh, reuse, meaning to uh, take the resource and use it in any context you want. So we get a lot of cases of uh, you know, items that are created for one purpose but actually get used for another. Uh, revise and remix, meaning to actually take a resource and um, make a copy of it and edit it and make it more relevant. Maybe replace examples with ones that are, that are more appropriate for students. Uh, take out parts that don't make sense for your students. Uh, maybe change notations if you use a different notation system in the textbook. Uh, and remix meaning to take multiple resources and mix them together. And then finally, uh, the right to redistribute, so freely share a copy of whatever you've created uh, or shared. And that could mean in the same format, so on, on, online as a PDF, in a Word doc, uh, but it could also mean in printed formats. Uh, so the bookstore could print out like a course pack version of it. You could go through a print-on-demand publisher to create a pretty printed and bound version. Or you might convert it to an audiobook. Um, and this is especially important for disability services because uh, when things are open, it makes it a lot easier to be able to make adaptations. So when we say this word permission, it, it, it typically refers to copyright. Um, that's the, the biggest piece of that, and there's uh, actually a great set of legal tools that make that really easy called the Creative Commons licensing. Uh, maybe you saw at the beginning, um, I had that little badge, uh, and that's a Creative Commons license that I used on these slides. And it indicates that everyone has permission to freely use these materials in all of these ways. You don't have to ask me for permission, you already have it. And that's really important because education is about sharing. And uh, it's also not one size fits all. And making sure that you grant that permission in advance and communicate it through a system of easily understood licenses, it makes it a lot easier for others to be able to do that. Um, and the important thing to note about Creative Commons licenses is that it's some rights reserved. So uh, we're all used to seeing all rights reserved. And uh, typically with Creative Commons licenses, uh, all of them still will reserve the right of attribution. So if you want to use these slides, you can, but you need to give me credit for being the original creator of them. And that's really important in the academic community. Uh, so it's important to highlight these licenses allow that. Uh, but there are also different terms that you can mi mix and match uh, that you can give to uh, give permissions for commu commercial or non-commercial use and whether you allow others to make adaptations and license them differently or have to license them the same way. Okay, so let me give you an example of some of uh, the open educational resources that are out there. Uh, so the uh, most kind of common type of open educational resource you'll hear about is open textbooks. So textbooks that are openly licensed and freely shared. And this project of Rice University in uh, Houston, Texas, uh, called OpenStax, is publishing uh, open textbooks for the highest enrollment university courses. So all of these books are published to the same standards that a traditional publisher might use. Uh, you can get a hard copy in the bookstore that's you know four color, uh, glossy glossy pages, hardcover, <laughs> uh, and you can also get them for free online. Here's their Principles of Economics textbook. Uh, it's not four hundred dollars. Uh, you can view it online for free. You can download a PDF. You can get the Bookshare. Uh, audio version, you can download it on iBooks, or you can order a print copy if you want. And here's what that costs on Amazon. $38.50. So, and this is like a nice book. Uh, and so the OpenStax textbooks have actually become very widely adopted. Uh, 
some of them are competing head-to-head -head with Pearson, Cengage, McGraw-Hill for adoptions. And one study found that they were adopted in about six, they had about 16% on average market share in their subjects. So, uh, you know, in terms of measuring, can open educational resources that are freely available be high quality? I mean, 16% of the market? Yeah, they can be. Uh, and so these are some of the subjects that they have. And here's what it looks like online. Um, I, I did uh, pull the chapter on elasticity and pricing, which is the economic uh, principle that describes why textbook prices have risen so rapidly. <laughs> uh, elasticity of demands. So you can go online right now um, to the link that's embedded here and uh, actually read this whole chapter for free. And you can see there's like a nice table of contents on the other side and then they have a, a platform where you can take all of these chapters and mix them up if you want to do them in a different, different order or take parts out. So really leveraging all of the things that we're used to doing with other forms of content on the internet to make education better. And what is really important about the OpenStax textbooks is that it's not just the textbook. It comes with the other kinds of things that you might expect to come with the textbook, like PowerPoint slides. Uh, and they, this company works with a number of outside partners that offer uh, homework software, tutoring services, different add-ons that you can mix and match with the textbooks. And I should note that because it's based at Rice University, this is a 100% nonprofit operation. Uh, what they do get, so most of the books themselves were developed through grants. They paid their authors upfront instead of royalties. They, they provided uh, upfront payments to authors to write these books and then release the textbooks openly for the entire world to use forever for free. And they work with partners who sell optional products around those books that provides funding back to OpenStax that they can use to keep the books up to date. It's an interesting, uh, an interesting model, and I think what's really exciting about this type of model, it, it's not saying that, that publishers don't have a role in the future of course materials, it's saying they should be focusing in the areas where commercial investment is really needed for innovation and providing access to different types of materials and not in selling the $400 <laughs> Principles of Economics textbook to thousands and thousands of students. And uh, the, the, so these textbooks have been used, uh, nearly half of all colleges have adopted one of the OpenStax textbooks, so they're really gaining uh, a lot of awareness. So these are just one example of a type of open educational resource. This is probably the highest pro profile project that's out there right now. Uh, but there are a number of other ones that are really uh, starting to gain steam. I think maybe the first one to gain a lot of national visibility was MIT's Open Courseware program in the early 2000s, which the idea was that MIT professors only teach a few hundred students a year, but create all of these world-class educational materials. And MIT set up a system that made it possible for professors to actually share those materials more broadly. And what they found is that by doing that, they could really showcase the world-class education that you can get at MIT. And uh, when the admissions office started to include metrics around this, they were finding that people especially international students who were applying to come to MIT, were finding out about this as an opportunity because they had access to the courseware and were able to see the kind of material that they would be learning. And uh, I've uh, traveled to lots of different places around the world and I often hear things like that, you know, oh, you're from America, like I know MIT's materials or I've learned so much from, from UC Davis's materials or UC Irvine who both have um, large courseware coursework programs. So they really are reaching a lot of people around the world uh, and actually benefiting the institution as well. But these also have uh, equity implications. So this is uh, a student, oh, his name is cut off, Jamika Mills is her name. Uh, and she is a student at Houston Community College. And she wrote this series of blog posts that's very compelling. I, I encourage you to go read it on the OpenStax website. But she talks about the kind of struggles that she faced as a first-generation college student getting access to course materials. 
she wasn't able to fill out the FAFSA application and get student aid because she was estranged from her parents. And if you don't have your parents' income info, you can't fill out the FAFSA. And it got to the point where the cost of the textbook in one course would depend whether she could take another course. And you know, here she is trying to get an education in order to provide for her children and have a better life than her parents. But textbooks were literally the barrier that she was facing. And she talks about how open educational re resources clear those barriers. So one other tool just to mention about open textbooks is this, the Open Textbook Library, where a lot of uh, open textbooks have been cataloged. I think one of the questions that we get is, you know, okay, you can find free materials on the web, but how do I know if they're good? Well, this is a good resource to go to. There are over 400 open <coughs> textbooks listed here, and you can actually read reviews by other faculty members, uh, what they think of the materials according to a rubric. Uh, and, you know, there's a, um, a set of criteria that are required to be met in order to be listed here. So if you're just starting out looking for open educational resources, this is an excellent place to start. So this all raises the question, uh, what are students paying for when they buy textbooks? And this is actually a, a piece I wrote for the Huffington Post uh, a couple of years ago because this big study came out that looked at students who were using open textbooks and compared them to their peers who were using traditional textbooks. And asked the question, you know, are students doing as well? And what it found is that students did as well on all of the measures that they, that they looked at. They looked at a variety of different measures of academic success, you know, grades, course completion, uh, uh, how many uh, courses the student took the next term. And in all of them, students did it as well. In many cases, they did better when using open educational resources. So, I mean, it really does beg the question, what are students paying for if it's possible to get the same outcomes when using high quality open materials. Obviously, there's a, uh, it's gonna be a process as we transition to new models for providing access to resources and it's not a change that's gonna happen overnight. But there's a growing body of evidence out there that really shows that uh, open educational resources uh, do address the cost concerns with at least no harm to students, but actually in many cases improving the, the potential outcomes for students. And there's actually one study just done that looked at uh, disaggregated student data at the University of Georgia, and in their context, the students who uh, were uh, more likely to be financially disadvantaged, students of color and part-time students actually uh, had the greatest gains Compared to their uh, uh, to compared to their peers, so uh, this is not just about reducing costs, though. It's also about enabling new forms of teaching and learning that make education better. And at a uh, liberal arts institution uh, where there are smaller class sizes, a real focus on innovation in the classroom, this is the greatest opportunity, I think. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of innovative use of open educational resources that are only possible in the open environment. So the first one comes out of Brigham Young University in Utah. And uh, this, the professor uh, who, who was teaching this course, Project Management for Instructional Designers, uh, he's da Dr. David Wiley, he's actually one of the leading thinkers in the open education movement. And he was teaching this course, it's a graduate level course, and there isn't really a textbook for this because it's such a narrow focus in their education school. So rather than trying to cobble together a set of resources and having students buy a bunch of expensive books to, to get access to the various components that he needed, what he decided to do was take an open textbook in general project management and assign to students as part of the course to turn it into project management for instructional designers. So throughout the course, the students went through this text, which because it's openly licensed, can be adapted and edited and shared. And they replaced examples, for example, about procurement uh, for you know, raw materials to procurement about educational materials. 
uh, for stakeholder discussions, uh, pulled out things like commercial providers and shipping, uh, and put in things like uh, the library and faculty and administrators. So students, rather than writing a bunch of papers that they struggle to write, the professor struggles to grade, and then everybody throws away at the end of the semester, what they did is write a textbook that is now used by future generations of the course. So every year uh, throughout the course, this book gets better, and it stays up to date. Uh, the copyright date, well I guess, so publishers have started future dating copyright, so when you don't believe the copyright date you see on a printed textbook, <laughs> but um, this book is, is literally up to date. Um, and this is, uh, you know, a quote from, from uh, Dr. Wiley, I wanted my students to gain a hands-on experience managing a project. So I asked my students to engage in a very large-scale revised remix project, which was to create this textbook. I think it's especially important for graduate students because they're potentially going into academia, uh, especially in an education school. So all of their names are actually listed as contributors to a peer-reviewed published work. So it also helps their career. So the second example I want to give uh, is Robin DeRosa uh, from Plymouth State University in New Hampshire. And she teaches uh, early American literature and uh, English faculty, I think I heard, oh, I saw a couple, yeah. yes. <laughs> so early American literature, well really anything before 1923 is in the public domain. So it's not covered by copyright. Uh, and what students were doing when they were purchasing their early American literature reader is buying a bunch of material that was already in the public domain. So, what Robin DeRosa did was go to Gu Project Gutenberg, which digitizes public domain works, pull down all of the text, and put it into a reader, and use this tool called Hypothesis, which is a little plugin that you can use on the web that allows uh, live annotation. And there are different settings where you can have private annotations, public annotations, and you know, with a reader, what you're paying for is the annotations and the curation of the material. So she had her students annotate it themselves and reply to, critique, uh, improve each other's annotations rather than simply reading the annotations of somebody else. And I especially love this quote from her. It does not feel patriotic to have my students pay money for public domain literature on their American heritage. <laughs> so uh, I, I like this example because it really does speak to the freedom of using open resources. Because this material is open, the students, the faculty members have full ownership about how they're using it in the classroom. If they don't like something about it, they can change it or critique it. And it leads to a much more rich and robust conversation between students and faculty members and uh, <coughs> creates a, a greater interrogation of the subject. And you know, these, these two examples I just gave are only possible in an open environment. In a closed environment, this is not, this is not a possibility. And I think we're only at the beginning of being able to imagine what innovations are possible. Like, think of all of the ways that students could be involved in uh, not just doing coursework, but doing coursework that contributes back to the sum of human knowledge. There's some examples of uh, professors who are um, assigning uh, students to write articles for Wikipedia. For example, helping to correct the imbalance in Wikipedia uh, between coverage of male scientists and female scientists. Professors assign students studying the history of science to write an article about female scientists for Wikipedia. That adds to uh, the wealth of human knowledge, but also helps to uh, correct an imbalance and inequity in a public resource. So the use of open educational resources, uh, it, it, the examples I just gave are a relatively small percentage of, of the cases of use of open educational resources. In most cases, it's simply taking a textbook off the shelf and adopting it. Um, 
But uh, one study by Babson found that almost one in 10 faculty now say that they use open resources in some way in their teaching. So this is becoming increasingly common. And while not every professor has the time or the space or, or the interest in setting up a system like Dr. Wiley or Dr. DeRosa, uh, the potential is there. And these resources are having a really big impact on the students. And it's starting to gain momentum in the policy space as well. Uh, some of you may have seen in, in the recent uh, two federal budgets, Congress included $5 million in each, each federal budget to support grant programs uh, to create open textbooks at colleges and universities. And the first grant was just awarded to a project at UC Davis called Weaver Texts, which is developing uh, chemistry and other STEM resources through a collaborative platform. Uh, they're going to develop uh, a end-to-end -end chemistry degree uh, or materials for an end-to-end -end chemistry degree that are fully open and available for anybody to use. Uh, so these, the, the, this funding, while in the context of the $1.3 trillion federal budget, this is <laughs> a very small amount of money, but Congress actually put money towards this. Like That is really significant. What this says is that open educational resources are part of our federal strategy for addressing college affordability. Uh, and I, I, it's really important to, uh, to, to recognize that. And then we're also starting to see a lot of momentum at the state level. Uh, all of these states have adopted policies that relate to open educational resources or launched major initiatives. Uh, here in California, actually, it's, it's one of the longest legislative histories. Um, there have been a number of uh, types of legislation. I believe all of it has focused on public institutions, uh, but the outputs of that work benefit everybody. So uh, examples of types of, of uh, legislation in California, all public institutions are required to mark which courses use uh, free or, or low-cost materials in their course catalogs. Uh, other states, including Washington, Colorado, and Texas, do that. Uh, in, in the past couple of years, Texas, Maryland, Washington, New York have given state funding to support OER initiatives. Uh, New York's governor actually gave $8 million each year over the last two years to support the SUNY and CUNY system to work on this. Uh, Colorado and uh, California have standing OER councils. Uh, here in California, it's called Cool for Ed. <laughs> um, it's a, a, a faculty, statewide fa faculty council com comprised of the three public systems. So we're starting to see these structures develop to support uh, types of open educational resource programs. And institutions are taking steps to make sure that implementation is going smoothly. And as uh, a number of you alluded to, it is a true partnership between faculty, teaching and learning, and libraries. So I'll give you a couple of examples of how it's working at different types of institutions. So at Emory University, uh, they were one of the first institutions to launch uh, an incentive grant program, uh, which is a very common model now, where uh, the library or another part of the institution provides the opportunity for faculty to apply for funding to transition from using an expensive traditional textbook to an open textbook. And that may be as simple as sitting down with a librarian and selecting an open textbook that fits the needs of your course, but it could involve creating a collection of resources that meet your needs, or even potentially publishing one. And uh, what's really exciting about this kind of program is that you don't start your search for a textbook by saying, which textbooks did the publisher send me and pick one? It's sitting down and asking, well, what are your course objectives? What, are you, what do your students need to learn? And finding content that supports your objectives and making sure that that's in the final product. And librarians can be especially helpful in that respect as professionals on campus who have experience with identifying and uh, searching for and evaluating resources that faculty can then evaluate for the appropriateness for their course. At Gettysburg College, uh, they have an institutional repository where they are now publishing open educational resources created by faculty. This is also common. I know that there's an institutional repository here. Um, what, what is it called? 
called Digital Commons. Digital Commons. Uh, so you can go and read all of the open educational resources that have been created by faculty that are actually published by the library. Other campuses are finding ways to recognize and change incentive structures to support open resources. At Texas A&M, the library partnered with the student government to create uh, an open education award that goes to faculty who have done something particularly significant <coughs> relating to open education, whether that's uh, a large adoption, their entire chemistry department just switched to using uh, the OpenStax textbook, and that is, I think, like something like 2,000 enrollments a year, and it's saving students uh, millions and millions of dollars. Uh, but also recognizing you know, innovative contributions to open education. <coughs> And that's something that can go on a CV. Uh, and there have been a couple of universities that actually take a look at their tenure and promotion guidelines and recognize the use and creation of open educational resources uh, as a contribution to scholarship. And, you know, of course, publishing, you can publish an, an open textbook through a, a traditional uh, process of, of peer review and all of that. And, uh, that might look just like a traditional textbook on your CV, but when it's actually called out and incentivized and it's supported, I think that's really, really significant. Um, and this is a, a top-tier research university in Canada. And I think what's really exciting about the UBC example is that this uh, policy change actually grew out of student advocacy. The graduate students were working with the faculty during the revision of the tenure and promotion guidelines and brought up this idea and worked in partnership with the faculty to craft uh, language that uh, suited the needs of uh, their campus context. So that's another way that collaborations between different stakeholders on campus can help advance open education. And Spark has a uh, place where you can actually go and learn a little bit more about what other institutions are doing on open education. Uh, it's a directory called Connect OER, where different campuses kind of register their <laughs> campus uh, status quo uh, and the types of programs that they have. So if you're interested in checking out, you can filter by different types of uh, institutions to learn more about it there. So the final part of this talk I want to focus on is just taking a step back and looking at the broader course material context. Because while all of these exciting developments on the open education side of things are gaining momentum and having an impact for students and changing lives like Jamika and other students, it's not the only transformation that's happening in the textbook market. We're starting to see changes from the, the traditional publishers in offering different types of solutions to campuses. And you know, I think the, the way that I think about this is that you know, costs have really gotten as bad as they can get in terms of textbook costs. And any step that you take is going to be better than where we are now. But the question is, as we look at these new models, are they going to be better? We need to make sure that we don't end up in the same position all over again with prices rising rapidly. And that's specifically about this model, inclusive access, which has been gaining a lot of attention. Um, I'm not sure if you have a program like this here at LMU. It's called different things like included or uh, auto access. But the idea is that when students register for a course, they get automatically charged for their course materials. So yeah. So let's give the industry that increased textbook prices 400% over the last three decades the ability to directly charge students for course materials. Uh, so <laughs> what could go wrong? Right. Um, so in some ways, this is saving students money in the short term. So they negotiate deals that really slash the cost of digital materials, like the $126 digital version of the $400 economics textbook. It's a step in the right direction in that respect because it is helping to lower costs for students right now. But we need to ask really significant questions about as we change the way that textbooks are purchased and how students are charged for their materials, what other barriers are we putting up? And there's that famous infographic that describes the difference between equality and equity. 
And equality is the state where to get over a barrier, you give uh, everybody the same box. You distribute resources equally. And that would be the equivalent of you know, maybe uh, charging all students a lower amount, but making every student pay that amount, as opposed to some buying the $400 print textbook and some sharing with their friends. But the state of equity is where you make sure that everybody has the same opportunities. And you know, boxes are not the right example when we're talking about digital resources, because digital resources are um, you know, abundant. Uh, but it does illustrate the difference between shifting to a model where we're simply spreading out the cost versus thinking about how can we actually bring that fence down? And that's what open is about. It's how can we reduce the barriers for students and make sure that everybody can get access to the same kinds of materials and have the same opportunities to participate. So we'll interrogate that a little bit more in a second. But going back to inclusive access. We are starting to see these kind of deals develop between publishers and institutions where they negoti negotiate maybe full catalog subscriptions to publisher resources. Um, I see the librarians in the room smirking because that is what happened 20 years ago with <laughs> journals. Mm -hmm. uh, libraries starting, as digital journals started to take off, libraries started to subscribe to full catalogs and uh, in so-called big deals. And it seemed like a great deal because you were getting access to all of these new resources that you wouldn't have had access to otherwise. But then what happened? Once it was locked in, the prices rose rapidly. Um, the graph I showed you at the beginning about textbook prices, journal prices look about the same. Uh, and we've only just started to get to the point where institutions are pulling the plug on it because they just can't afford it anymore um, to give faculty access to all of the research that they need. So what I find really alarming right now is that this is a press release from one of the largest publishing companies, Cengage. Uh, like, I have written press releases like this as a lifetime advocate for open, affordable textbooks. They're starting to write things that sound exactly the same. The, one of the companies that is responsible for driving up prices rapidly <laughs> And the company that sells that $400 economics textbook put out this press release. New survey, college students consider buying course materials a top source of financial distress. And provides all of these statistics about what students are trading off between buying textbooks and you know, food and taking more courses. And they actually, uh, this, is a <laughs> this is a screenshot because they actually deleted this tweet um, after, well, we don't need to talk about that. But um, <laughs> I was angry. Uh, so, high textile costs pose barriers to students' ability to see, succeed in college, and many take drastic measures in order to afford their materials. So, some age unlimited students finally have an alternative to this expensive cycle. And then four in ten students skip meals to afford textbooks. And this is from a publishing company that sells, that is responsible for the problem that they're now using statistics about to sell solutions to. So, that's like buying a fire extinguisher from an arsonist. <laughs> um, so, uh, and you know, I think it's, it's really shocking that a, a company would use students with food insecurity in a marketing pitch, and that's why this, this tweet was ultimately deleted, but I think it's emblematic of how the industry is thinking about this problem. And we need to think about, you know, what, what does the future look like? if we give them the keys to students' bank accounts. And that's not to say that we shouldn't take steps to help students get access to course materials in the short term. You know, if, if, if we can find ways to save students money, even if these models are a little bit scary uh, for the long term, that's okay. But it needs to be a broader conversation on campus, and we have a responsibility uh, to make sure that we're protecting the interests of students, especially as we start to transition to digital materials, because every time a professor assigns a digital material, what they're essentially doing on behalf of their students is accepting the terms of use. And I think this is going to be one of the big conversations we see in the future about digital textbooks, which is, you know, what data are publishers collecting on students? And what are they doing with that data? And what's in those terms of use? Just like when a professor makes a decision to decide a textbook, they lock the student into the price that that materials cost. They also lock them into whatever end user license agreement the publisher wants to put on that material. 
and we're not talking about this yet on campuses, and this, this needs to be a question, uh, especially in the, day, the days of Cambridge Analytica, and um, you, know, you don't want to see your provost face on the next um, you know, <laughs> newspaper article about data breaches and, and um, you know, unethical uses of data. So uh, you know, these, are, these are new questions that we're just confronting now as digital materials become, start to become part of the norm. But we need to think critically, and that's part of equity. It's, part of, uh, it, it's about thinking what barriers might we be creating as we seek to lower other barriers. And um, can, can I close this? Yeah. I think it's a bit loud. It's just gotten noisy. Yeah. So we all have the, the terms diversity, equity, and inclusion, and often use them as a single term, but they, they actually all mean different things. Uh, and I, I go back to the way that um, Barbara Chow, the former education program director at the Hewlett Foundation, describes it. Diversity is a number, inclusion is a process, and equity is an outcome. So as we think about equity in education, we should be thinking about how to make the processes that we're using to identify educational materials, identify new models for affordability, inclusive. And think about whose voices are missing and making sure that we include the perspectives of beneficiaries of those changes in the conversation and not students, making sure that they have uh, a, seat, a seat at the table. And then connecting this all back to open, we are starting to see traditional publishers move in the direction of open, just in the way that we've seen traditional journal publishers start to move in the direction of open access. You know, Elsevier claims to be the world's largest open access publisher. <laughs> <laughs> so open is really, at the end of the day, it's about values. It's not just a set of attributes, it's not just the five R's or a license that you put on content. It is about values. It's about making sure everybody has a chance to participate and everybody gets access to educational materials. It's about uh, removing that fence and helping to lift people up to make sure that they can get access to the same opportunities. And um, you know, going back to the social justice mission of this institution, Thinking about open is enabling strategy to help uh, everybody get access to the same types of resources and opportunities without discrimination, without barriers. Open isn't always the answer, and it's not always easy, but it's a tool that we have. And what I hope I've done is made the case that when it comes to course materials, Open is an important strategy to focus on, and as we think about what the future of course materials is, think about the steps that you can take in your own classrooms. Um, you know, consider open before adopting a traditional textbook. Maybe right now it's not possible, but at least make that effort. Uh, call the library, see if they might be able to help. Uh, think as an institution about what incentive structures you might be able to put in place so that faculty can get the support that they need to look for open resources, maybe create them, maybe adapt them, and make sure that it's rewarded. Because open isn't just about the students who are in your classroom, but it's also about everybody. And everybody who could benefit from those resources in the community around LNU, who might be able to use and build upon the work that you're doing here. I like to talk about open this way. So, Open is about enabling everyone everywhere to freely use, share, and build upon knowledge in any way that they can imagine. And that's a value. It speaks to the values of social justice and inclusion and uh, making sure that our educational systems are contributing to the sum of human knowledge and the betterment of human society. Uh, and open is an enabling strategy for that.
<laughs> oh, it's fine. I just needed to move it. From oh, okay, good. Everything's fine. <laughs> Wait, you didn't kill your computer? No, 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 no. no. Okay, good. Uh, I just didn't want it sitting there in case the power cord okay. um, sparked or something. Nicole, do you have time for questions? Absolutely. Does anyone have questions? Um, in your presentation, you talked about um, when a professor assigns an open source, they're essentially making the decision for the students to accept the end user agreement. Um, if that open source is actually through the library, is that still the case? Uh, so, so if I have a, if I, I ask the, the library to adopt an ebook that I can then share with the I entire see. class. Um, who's, the, who's the responsible party? The library, mm -hmm. i.e. the university, or the student? So I, I, it's a process question. So uh, the type of situation I was talking about is when, um, for example, through inclusive access, uh, you assign a digital textbook, students get an access code that they type into the publisher's website to get access to the material. When they type in that access code, they have to click the, like, I agree to the terms of use in order to then access the material. So uh, I think uh, it, it would depend, but my understanding is that if the material is available through the library, it would be covered by whatever, um, whatever the license is.